If you're in the market for investment-worthy bags, watches, and fine jewelry, Rebag is the answer. Rebag is a luxury resale marketplace where each piece is carefully vetted and verified by experts to ensure quality and authenticity. If you're in the market, use Rebag to buy and sell finds from the world's top brands, including Hermes, Chanel, and Cartier. Head to Rebag.com to get 10% off your first purchase with code REBAG10. Shop today at Rebag.com. That's R-E-B-A-G.com. And use promo code REBAG10 for 10% off your first purchase. Purchase. Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast, GoPowerCat.com's Kansas State Athletics Show. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, from the GPC Studios, here's your host, GoPowerCat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the PowerCat Questions Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. I am Tim Fitzgerald, publisher of Go PowerCat, and here in the GPC studio with me, of course, is Zach Carlson, Cole Carmody, and Ryan Gilbert. Cole, just uh, an exciting, uh, normal Saturday night in Aggieville for you. Mm. Completely normal. Mm-hmm. Scary happenings in Aggieville. It happens. We have Zach. Would you say we have something like this happen about every three, four years? I think there was one in twenty twenty, one in two thousand seventeen, probably one in fifteen. I remember there was a kid in my group project where that was the victim of one of these shootings. And really, no one in the group project knew, and because uh, like they were wondering where this kid was on Monday morning, and I was like. You know, we got shot, right? They're like, what? That's a pretty good excuse to get out of Yeah. Homework. Yeah. Just what happened? bizarre, bizarre, bizarre. But life goes on. And so does Kansas State Sports. We're here to answer your questions at Wabash Station. This is how it works. Everyone gets to listen to our podcast, but only the members at Go Powercat get to ask the questions. So if you want to be involved in the question asking portion of this, you have to sign up at GPC and head over to Wabash Station and fill out a question in our questions thread. And then, then you must pass Zach Carlson's rigid standards for question asking. That's correct. Also, if you join, it's 50% off. Oh, yeah, it's 50% off. Well, not the prices. Like, you don't get half of the site. I mean, the price is 50% off. You get the full site. You get the full site for, for half price. Right. That got Through. a little confusing. I didn't want you to think you are going to pay 100 bucks and then only see half the site. Like, only see Cole stuff, which isn't even half the site. I don't know. I'm down a rabbit hole right now. I I'm not it. certain when that ends, but it ends sometime. I think after signing day. I think it's a signing It's a signing day special, so sign up for We're, signing day. We haven't pushed it because for whatever reason, K-Staters don't take advantage of these specials for the most part until the last day. Hmm. Right? Right. I mean, we could have a 20-day sale and 99% of our sales would be on the last day. Yep. I don't know. Man, I don't I don't understand how that works. Again, we're sponsored by The Fridge. Make sure you stop into The Fridge every time you're in Manhattan. It's at the corner of Claflin and Westport, right across a Mexican place with a bell. The Fridge. I love it. Man. Our segment sponsors are Tanners and the High Low. The High Low's tricked out for Christmas. If you want a little Christmas spirit and booze, that's your place. They get all their booze from the fridge. So should you. I need I need more football at Tanner's. I don't I don't like not having football at Tanner's. I, and I'm not an NFL guy. I don't I don't just go to a bar to watch NFL unless it's the Chiefs in a significant game and I don't have my TV show. Because it'd be kind of bad to not show up for my TV show to get drunk. I like when they do your advertisements for the TV show. It's weird to be watching the Chiefs and then see yourself on an advertisement. <laughs> it's a little bit unsettling because you see all your flaws. That's why I know. I, in. I know people don't see it, but I have flaws. I, mm. I know. Mm-hmm. I think you. Mm-hmm. I, I, see, Gil thinks I'm just perfect, and I'm not. I've got flaws. One of my flaws, though, Zach, is not getting to the questions quickly enough. Yeah, we've uh, stumbled here a bit. Here we go. I don't know who's got it, but someone speak now. They don't even know. They're just nodding at each other. From the first half of the first 
question of the first half comes from TN Cat. Can we expect any surprises on signing day that K-State lands that weren't on your radar? Mm, probably not. No. no. Well, the, the, the class is pretty much set. I would, I would imagine K-State's more likely to lose somebody than land somebody. But, and I was talking to Wally about this last night, but we were talking about who was the last major person that was a surprise signing day guy. It was Jake Waters in 13. It's been like eight years since, actually nine years, because that would be earlier than mm-hmm. it would have been in February. So it's been nine signing classes since K-State's had like a true like playmaker surprise. There's been other surprises, yeah. but no one significant like that. I don't think anybody is going to – significant will flip. Um, I know uh, Trey Fight just decommitted. He's a defensive end out of Oklahoma, I believe. Um, uh, I, I, I could be wrong on that. I'll look it up right now. But I know he decommitted, and I know he was high on K-State. So uh, they did just take another defensive end, Ryman. Um, so I, maybe if they were taking Ryman, they probably wouldn't take Fight. But I know that he did just decommit, and K-State was in the final running um, Trey Height from Tatum, Texas, uh, defensive end. So, I mean, maybe keep that on your radar. But other than that, I don't think there's going to be any major surprises. But, you know, I I got to be honest, guys. I, I don't think this is a terrible class. I think it's there's not a lot of super high-end talent. But as far as depth goes, I I think there's some pieces there. Well, it's interesting to me. <clears throat> that they seem to be going deeper into the develop, developmental process than they were even before because they don't need the immediate impact guys. It, it almost feel like now they're looking at these recruiting classes like, okay, we're going to take about 15 guys and take some chances. And if like three to five of them work out, you know, if, if we pull some guys that are regulars out of this and maybe one star, that's great because we're going to do the rest through the transfer portal and get guys that can come help us immediately. Uh, it, this class isn't done until the transfer portal is done. And I'm so glad that 24-7 now is going to have transfer portal rankings and combined rankings and individual rankings. And you'll be able to look at the class from whatever context fits your institution. If you're a school that is going to take a lot of transfer portal guys, so it sounds like K-State will be from here on out, and they should be based on the success they've had with those guys. Because the transfer portal's weird. You think surefire guys, if they're coming from a power five, would be successful, particularly starters, and we're not necessarily seeing that around college football. Mm-hmm. But at K-State, we're seeing the guys sometimes, Rush used to be the exception here, that come from the smaller programs are the biggest success. It's Amazing to me. I mean, Stubblefield is, we thought he'd be, we were questioning why give out that scholarship, but they certainly saw something in him. So um, it's still even hard to judge transfer portal guys because of how that's set up. They're going to still have to base the players in the transfer portal on what they did as high school recruits. Well, that, that really doesn't give you an accurate measurement of a guy that didn't get recruited because he wasn't evaluated high enough, but blossomed as a freshman in college and became a force and now is transferring as a junior. That's not the same guy that was 17 years old and getting ranked. So it's it's going to be a little bit off, but th- this class is still a work in pro- progress. Will there be any surprises? Well, I don't know. It'd be a surprise to us. I mean, that's the thing. If a, you say a yeah. surprise, well, if well, we knew about it, yeah. would it be a surprise? So I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think they're just trying to clean up the edges of this class now and move on to the transfer portal. Speaking of the transfer portal, the next question comes from OilerCat2. Will focusing on the transfer portal make up for the usual low high school recruiting classes K-State has had historically? They were successful this year with transfers. I just worry if they don't get so lucky in years to come, how it can affect depth. It seems every second string player across the country will be jumping into the transfer portal in the future. Well, yeah, it could affect that. Just like um, too much junior college recruiting can throw you out of whack, too. But it's a reality. I mean, you just got to you got to use it if you're Kansas State. There's there's no way around it. You you can get access to some guys that you just weren't going to get out of high school for whatever reason. And and I think this staff, because of their background, are actually going to be accessing guys that nobody gave a chance out of high school. 
and they ended up in the FCS. I think we're going to see a lot of FCS transfers. That could be K-State's angle here. Hey, we've got this legendary FCS coach who proved that you can win at high levels with the players that will go to a North Dakota State. Why don't you come here, Bradley Moore? Why don't you come here, Stubblefield? Why you know, and just over and over, I think we, we're going to start seeing this. They're going to be the place where an FCS player said, I will say, I know that staff will give me a good chance to play at the Power Five. What I think is so interesting about this, and part of the reason why I think K State's strategy in recruiting up to this point has you it has been questioned, but I think they, the master plan behind all of this is get kids out of high school that you think will stick around for four years. Right, that's a huge issue because we're gonna run a piece fairly soon looking at the top rated recruit in each class and where are they now well i'll tell you right now from 2018 and 2019 john holcomb chris heron now i get that was under bill snyder those were bill snyder guys but they're not even playing football right now and they would be juniors and seniors next year for the season so get guys that can stick around in your program and you fill your immediate holes with the transfer portal I mean, that is how this staff is building. And, you know, is it going to is it going to work? We'll we'll find out. But I mean, the way that they utilize the transfer portal right now, you mentioned it fits with the FCS. I think it's something there's something about getting a guy with a chip on their shoulder Mm -hmm. to come into your program and say, guess what? I'm going to be bought in from day one because Stubblefield, he was bought in from day one. Heck, before he was even at K-State, he was bought in. Because he had that opportunity. And we've seen that with basketball, too. Look at Marquise Noel. He is bought in. He had an opportunity to come to an institution that was, quote, unquote, better than where he was. And he's bought in. I think that is how K-State is. If they want to turn the program around and get to a point where they can consistently win, this is how you do it. Now, once you get up there, maybe that changes. But on the on the way up, you have to get guys that are bought into the program and getting high school kids that will stick around for four years and getting transfer portal players that can buy in from day one and fill the gaps. I think that's what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not concerned really if they get it wrong as far as depth because, I mean, if you've looked at every year that the transfer portal's been around, K-State's been winning. You know, the guys they lose aren't you know, they go elsewhere and they don't necessarily perform as well as they played at K-State and what they could have meant to their pro- to the program at K-State. And then on the other hand, K-State's bringing in guys that make an impact. You know, everyone they've brought in has been a, a net positive, I think, on the on the on the team. So I, I'm, I don't think that K-State's going to lose out on that. And I think they'll get it right nearly every year just because there's so much more talent in the transfer portal and if K-State's going to commit resources to getting these guys and you know if they can give the vision to these transfers saying hey we need help you can help us right now you know come play I think that K-State's set up in a, in a good place for that well you know you mentioned how, where they go elsewhere and I and I think a lot of the times fans can get caught up in just that because it just because a kid goes down to another level and and they don't play as much what does that what does that really mean like for k-state right i i understand that fans will see well why are they going there you know and that it's a valid question right but i think it points to just how good of coaches that k-state has right now the fact that they're able to get the most out of these players while they're here that means that they can coach football right i mean that's the bottom line recruiting does it have its flaws sure but these guys can coach football and i think that's why getting some of those fcs players will make um they can they can make them the best version of themselves at least i think that's what the coaches think um in their mind uh third question comes from el camino cat assuming k-state signs adrian martinez and he is full, fully healthy next fall and colin klein is the play caller will they re-emphasize the quarterback run game the thoughts of martinez vaughn and Denine together in the backfield gets me excited um i would think so i mean no, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is you're going to play to their strengths i i'm intrigued by it i i'll be honest I, i've only watched bits and pieces of him through his career i know he has not had great success but does that lie at his feet? We'll find out. I I don't see how you don't use the quarterback run game. But I think we're probably making a 
an assumption that we can't make that Colin will call a lot of quarterback run. I mean, he might know when to call it, not that he wants to call it a lot. You know what I mean? He might he might be thinking, oh, I was quarterback. They called it way too often. I got the crap beaten out of me. So you just don't know. Uh, but I think he, he will be savvy enough to play to a quarterback strengths, which any good coordinator would do. And I, I feel like Courtney Messingham did that too. He tried to – maybe he got too cautious about Will Howard and his weaknesses. But, you know, so uh, I – I think he'll run. I'll, you know, I think he'll throw. He'll he'll play quarterback. At the end of the day, I don't know that they, it would be much different than how you would handle a healthy Skylar Thompson or a healthy Will Howard with the run game mixed in, which has been effective. I think Martinez is a little bit more dynamic. And Ryan and I, I we were watching an NFL game. I don't remember. I know it was the Ravens. I don't remember how long ago it was. It may have been the Sunday night game. And they're sitting there and they're talking about how the offensive coordinator for Baltimore specifically – design the playbook for Lamar Jackson. You have to design the offense for your quarterback because it starts with him. Mm -hmm. Whatever Adrian Martinez does well, because I'll tell you right now, that Nebraska locker room is is toxic. Cade Warner talked about it himself. Sure did. So how much of Nebraska losing falls on Adrian Martinez? I don't know. But I do know that they were – it was like the first team in the history of college football to lose every single game by one possession or or less than 10 points or something ridiculous like that, right? I mean, Adrian Martinez is a – he's not a – he's an upgrade over Will Howard. I will say that. He is an upgrade – skill-wise, he is an upgrade over Will Howard. I will die on that hill. And I think he, quite honestly, is a better quarterback than Skylar Thompson. If you put a healthy Adrian Martinez on this year's team – K State probably is better than seven and five, and I'm not afraid to say that. I really am not. Zach? Uh, well, if you're going to put a healthy Adrian Martinez on the team, I think you have to put a healthy Skylar Thompson on the team. That's fair. So yeah, yeah. if you if you have a Skylar a healthy Skylar Thompson, they're better than seven and five. Mm-hmm. So I think the arguments kind of kind of moot at that point. Mm-hmm. I think that you know I, I think Adrian Martinez. I, I'll stick with it if he comes. Great, but. You know, he's injured. He's going to have to get healthy and he's going to be taking away reps from either Jake Rubley or Will Howard who need the experience at some point. And they're going to, if they're going to be the quarterbacks of the future, then yeah, they need, they need to play. But if you're going to keep bringing in guys, if they're perceived as not ready, because Will Howard or Jake Rubley needed to be ready this year, if Skylar Thompson wasn't going to come back, I mean, maybe they would have gone to the portal then and found somebody, but you know, I just, you know, if, if if Adrian Martinez does come, you know, it should be good having a veteran leader, so to speak, in the quarterback room. I don't know if it's the best thing for K-State beyond this season, because at some point you're going to have to look to the future. Because if Will Howard and Jake Rubley aren't the guys in 2023 or beyond, you know, what what was 2022 then if you weren't getting them ready to go? Yeah, I think that's a valid argument. Um Next question comes from Wyatt Bowlinger, 15. Deuce Vaughn has been named AP First Team All-American as an all-purpose player. How significant is it for the program's recruiting to have a player like Deuce shining in the national spotlight? Not good for running back recruiting. Yeah. (laughs) I'll be honest. It's going to be a struggle. It's an ongoing struggle. I mean, it's good. It's good. Anything high profiles that reflects well on the program is good. There's no negatives to it, but... I don't know how big of an upside it is. Bottom line, it, players want to play and they want to win. Varying degrees each one. I mean, some guys just want to play and go play linebacker at KU. And other guys want to win and they go to they go to Oklahoma and sit on the bench. I feel like K-State is the the nice middle where you could maybe help the team really rise up and be good, but you're also not going to suck. You're not going to celebrate a, a pick six as your highlight of your season because you only won two games. So I, I I I understand what you're talking about with the running back recruiting, but if you're a kid like Dylan Edwards, who K State has been all over, he was I believe he was Gatorade Player of the Year in Kansas. He's, if you're not familiar, he's a running back for Derby, going to be a senior next season. Um, by all accounts, K State is extremely recruiting him very hard. You use that to your advantage, right? I mean, hey, this could be you in this system. Yeah. So you use Deuce as 
you use them and say, hey, it is possible to be an All-American at this position at K-State. You might not see – even if you go 7-5, and five, like let's, let's, let's be absolutely 100 percent real here. If K-State does not have Deuce Vaughn, do they make a bowl game? I know we can sit here and talk about yes. Joe Irvin being good, but do they do they make a bowl game? He is their leading receiver and leading rusher. Joe Irvin's more than capable of doing most of the stuff he did. Yeah. Joe Irvin I, I think if Deuce went in if Deuce was injured, similar to how Skylar Thompson got injured, I think Joe Irvin would have filled in just fine. But he for a whole season? I think yeah. I think Joe Irvin is good enough to be the starter. You know, if Deuce wasn't there, I think Joe Irvin's fine. He's adequate. But we're but we're in agreement that Deuce Vaughn is miles ahead. He is a playmaker that's yes. miles ahead of Joe Irvin. Yes. If Joe also, Irvin, if you in, give Joe Irvin the opportunity, I think he capitalizes. I don't think he's a first team All American. Okay, <laughs> no, he's not a first team All American. But getting to a bowl game, like you said, I think that Joe Irvin could get K State to a bowl game. Okay. Well, but, Cole, what you're talking about, in theory, I do think works. But what if Edwards or whoever it is doesn't work out? You can't put all your eggs in one basket no. because uh, if you're going to be that Joe Irvin guy or whoever is perceived to be that that backup, why do they want to come to K State? You know, if they have a conversation with Irvin or anybody like that, they'd be like, "No, don't go to K State. You're not going to see the field because they're they're focusing so much on just this starting running back." So for. For the next year, sure. But if you're Joe, I understand that Joe Irvin situation is in the same class as Deuce Vaughn. But if you're, you know, going to be a freshman when Deuce Vaughn is a senior or when he's a junior, if he plans to go to the NFL or however this works out, you see the light at the end of the tunnel knowing I have a chance to be the guy the next year. And this is how they use their running backs. I think that there's something to that. And let's be honest, we don't know what the offense is going to look like, right? I mean, it's nice for the program to have a player as good as Deuce. Because he puts Kansas State on the radar. Yes, exactly. I agree with that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's good. It's good from a brand perspective. It's not necessarily great for a running back perspective as far as recruiting goes. But at the same time, Deuce will have to leave at some point and graduate. They're already three cycles past Deuce. You know, after signing day, they're moving on to next season. You know, the 2023 class, and Deuce will be Deuce will have, you know, in a typical. I don't know, lifetime, one year, but with COVID, he'll have two more years. But after next season, he's past the midway point. They're going to have to replace him and find him. So, you know, at that point, it becomes a big, you know, benefit, I think, for him being, you know, the more awards that K-State players can get and the more draft picks they can get that aren't Carson Wentz, that aren't Trey Lance, that they can actually put up in in marketable material and videos and stuff saying, hey, that guy went to K-State. He didn't just play for Chris Kleiman. The more that they get that, the better it'll be for recruiting. And I get it's di- different for di- different circumstances. But Fitz, let me ask you this. When Darren Sproles was doing what he was doing as a, as a running back at K-State, did that help the running back recruitment? I mean, did you feel like that there was better players that came in because they saw Darren? Or even use Michael mm-hmm. Bishop. I mean, was there better quarterbacks that came in because they saw? Or was that just based off of solely on the team's success? I mean, Jonathan Beasley and L. Roberson were pretty good. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those <laughs> I guys I mean, yeah, followed. you can go back and, and yeah. Running back's not the same because, I mean, the program fell off in 2004 and yeah. five, And mm-hmm. Sproles' his last season was four. I couldn't tell you who the running back was after Darren Sproles. Hmm. Yeah, not off the I top couldn't of tell you. So I I don't I think it's overplayed that your program will drop off the loss of a player, but it also can be real. Mm-hmm. But it may not just be that player. It might have been the whole class that it's quietly been good and he just was the the front of it. <clears throat> I think I agree with Gills though. If Deuce Vaughn had gone down, they would have found not Joe Irvin, but Joe Irvin doing this and someone else doing that. They would have Close those numbers up quite a bit. What they wouldn't close up, though, is those deuce plays, like the touchdown at Oklahoma State. Correct. Th- those things, those instinctive deuce things that he does. Your typical carries. I think they would have been fine with Joe Irvin carrying the ball, catching the ball out of the backfield. Well, they might not have thrown to the running back as often, but maybe they throw it to the tight end more. I mean, you can make an argument they don't throw to the tight end because they're using Deuce Vaughn as the changeup receiver. So I, I just think they'd move around the playbook and acclimate to do some things that other guys could help out with. You, you don't just, you know, this. You, if you're a play caller, you don't say, well, we don't have Skyler, we don't have Deuce, I guess we better not do anything. I mean, you do things that you think will work. 
To answer this question, though, if I'm a recruit, I would much rather care about K-State making a prominent bowl game or having a good ranking at the end of the year, whatever it may be, team success. If you're a recruit and you're only focused on yourself and, oh, I could be an AP player of the year, that's not the, the type of player that I would want in my locker room. But that's just that's just me. Yeah, I agree with you. Fair enough. Um, last question of the first half comes from Claws Out, Balls Out. Will beating LSU do anything for recruiting? I don't remember beating Michigan helping much, but it is a different staff. Yeah, I I don't know. You can't compare the two, and I don't know if it'll help. I mean, you got to try to make it help. I kind of felt like the old staff didn't really get that deep into recruiting. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, it, that's such a general question. I'm not sure. I think but getting I mean, the eighth – oh, go ahead, Zach. I mean, you look at LSU and you look at Michigan at the time in 2013, I think they're kind of in similar spots. You know, a coaching change – I mean, yes, LSU just came off a national championship. Michigan had not. They yeah, were Brady they were struggling. They, they were struggling with Brady Hoke. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't remember when they got rid of Brady Hoke. If he still had one more year, if, I think they had an interim, didn't they, at the time? Because that I, was Harbaugh right afterwards. I know Harbaugh was next, yeah. but I don't remember if it was if he was ready to go. But you know, I I don't know if it'll help, but. I think that you you have to – I mean, obviously, you want to go win the game. I mean, that's why, why you know, you're K-State and you want to win. Um, but as far as recruiting goes, yeah, it's a feather in your cap to say you beat the national champion from two years ago. But, I mean, how many of those guys they're going to play on that – on the fourth, how many of them actually played in the national championship game two years ago? I think it's more about getting to eight wins than it is about beating LSU. No, I agree. That's a great point. I think it's more about getting that eighth win. Beating LSU is a nice piece of that. But in reality, one game doesn't doesn't alter much unless it's a title game of some sort. It doesn't really alter your perception of your football program. I think, now, the, going to the Texas Bowl yeah. and having it be the only game yes, on in nice. that time window, I think that's important. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I just don't see a kid watching this game and going, that's where I want to go because I beat a mediocre LSU team this year. Well, getting getting back to that, I mean, I think being a champion of a bowl, obviously, would have more – and getting the eighth – getting a cha- being a champion of a bowl and winning the eighth game will have more of an impact than just strictly beating LSU because when they walk into the practice facility, when they walk into the near and they have the trophy there, that – will signify more of a successful season than beating an LSU team that barely snuck into a bowl. So what you're saying is the opponent doesn't matter. Correct. They could play Middle Tennessee State in the Texas Bowl, and it would be the same effect. I think f- for for recruiting purposes, yes. Now, for okay. fans, for fans, I think, say, oh, we beat LSU. That would be a lot better than beating yeah. Army or Navy in the, in the Armed Forces Bowl, right? I mean, that's just kind of how I view it from a inside of a football perspective. So why why are we going to say this about recruiting? But last week we had this discussion about Colin Klein and about how if he has a you know a great game, you know calling sixty plays or whatever, let's promote him to offensive coordinator. Why are we going to put so much stock into that when, like we mentioned, LSU is not going to have numerous starters that are opting out and they're on the down you know trajectory, whatever. Why are we going to focus so much? from a coaching, you know, a potential coaching perspective, but not recruiting. I think that's more of a fan perspective. Though. Yeah. I think fans will see the game, you know, just your average fan that maybe doesn't follow, you know, as closely as others, but your average fan will look at it and go, oh, well, he did a really good job. I wouldn't mind seeing that for 12 games a year. But in reality, the well, staff will. what fans think, though? <laughs> well, you know what I, I mean? think fans have a huge part of a huge part of the program. It is it is the lifeline of a program. If there's no fans to go to the games, yeah. then it, there's a they, there's a huge part in well, that. The the trap for Chris Kleiman is exactly that. The fans will get fired up. They'll fans overreact. They just mm-hmm. do. I mean, and that's fine because that's why we're in business because they like to come to our message boards and overreact whether it's good or bad they will overreact as you know a totality you know they'll do that so if chris Kleiman has a k-state legend that calls a good game and bracks up a bunch of points even if it's de- depleted lsu fans will be clamoring for him and then he names someone else well he'll get sideways with some fans but if he, you know, the other way around, if it's a, they stink it up again, it looks exactly the same. The fans are smart enough to know, well, you can't 
You can't name this guy a coordinator. He's not ready. So there'll be a reaction one way or the other. And I, I think Chris Kleiman is is a more aware of the general fan base than most coaches are, which is good and bad. I, I you know I'm not arguing either way. Sometimes you need to ha- close it off, and other times it it helps to know what the the pulse of your fan base is. And uh, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I just think this game proves why TV networks want to show brand names because fans are fired up at LSU. It proves why they pick them because you're more fired up to play LSU than you would be if they played eight and four Kentucky, but Mississippi State, even A and M. I mean, LSU is a good brand, and that's that kind of proves the point here. We see more value in playing LSU than Middle Tennessee State. Now, in reality, is it that way? Does a uh, a head coach see it that way? Does a recruit see it that way? I don't know. I'm not in their shoes. I don't. I really don't know. I know this. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun just to see the Power Cat on the field with LSU helmet. It was fun against Michigan. It's been fun against USC. It is fun because the program before Bill Snyder never belonged on that field before. And now to be in position to play these teams in postseason, even if it's a, a bowl game against a seven to five and six and six is still fun. It's good. It's good. And got to win it. You butt at the bottom and end of it all. Cole's right. Just win, man. Doesn't matter who you're playing. You got to win this. Got to get that eighth win. You got to get that momentum. That's the most important thing. That's it for the first half of the Power Cat Questions podcast. On the other side, we got more of your great questions from Wabash Station. And remember, we're sponsored by the fridge. GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat Podcast continues after this short break. Selling a little or a lot? Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage, to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Shopify is here to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify has got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 15% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash odyssey podcast all lowercase go to shopify.com slash odyssey podcast now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash odyssey podcast my days working and taking care of my little ones can be a lot I checked out Care.com and it was so easy for me to find local, experienced, and background check sitters. Finding our babysitter was way more affordable than I thought. Care.com makes it super easy. Search for qualified candidates. You can view their profiles, read reviews and ratings, check their availability, send messages directly, get the help that you need. Care.com should be every person's go-to. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast. Now, let's return to the GPC Studios. Welcome back to the Power Cat Questions Podcast, sponsored by The Fridge Wholesale Liquor. And our segment sponsors are Tanners and The High Low. Make sure you're supporting all those great businesses down in Aggieville. So I got frustrated on uh, Friday. You guys had, had beer and burgers, and mm-hmm. I wanted to come join you, <laughs> forgetting it was graduation week. I'm just glad they had a table. I saw you like three cars in front of me, and I turned. Where'd you turn? Right at Kites? Yeah. Whatever choices I made were wrong. I did three laps through Aggieville. 
through every parking lot. There's nothing out I've there. Paralleled and, outside of Aggie Village. So I asked this question on Twitter. What happened to the spots the Marriott took up because we were supposed to get them? I and, swear that in the agreement. Absolutely it was. It said that it was going to be a partial public parking garage. Absolutely it, it was. Be, it wasn't going to be a valet hotel only parking garage. There's no way the city of Manhattan would have given them that lot because I think it was like a dollar sale or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Without getting recovering those spots, they were supposed to have a like 119 public spots in their garage, and they don't have them. And that's all I tweeted about. I'd like to know where those spots went. Yeah. And people are like, we well, can park at the beach. Well, I know not, you can park yes. at the beach. I used to be freaking president of the the Aggieville Business Association. I know I could park in City Park or the beach, but it's 38 degrees with a howling wind, and I got a bad knee. Who wants to go walk two blocks in the cold for a burger? It doesn't sound like a very fun time I'll to bash so long like that. I know. Or am, I not, am I not allowed to name that? And, that's fine. And because um, I was looking forward to that burger. Um, not, not, you weren't looking forward enough to it. And, well, exactly. And <laughs> people are like, well, the garage will solve that. The garage is going to tip Aggieville. We're going to see business closures on the. 1200 block or 1100 block constantly because they're going to be so far away from the parking. Most people just stop in a place closer to the garage. I don't know. Anyhow, I got your, time I got your order for you. What? The uh, chicken that used to be the burger. You put the Yeah, yeah. I do burger. resist temptation with yep, uh, the chicken. chicken instead I did of that. Burger. I did that. For it's you. good. Isn't it? It's good. Mm-hmm. The point is they took a parking lot. Right. We were supposed to get the parking for it. What happened to it? Was there an agreement that was? Did they amend the agreement? Did some the, like? How, did how, they pull something off on us? How did I, they I'm curious. exactly? That's why I tweeted at the city of Manhattan. I'd like an explanation with what happened. And if it was above board, you would think whoever runs our Twitter would say, "Yeah, the the city commission amended that later, and we just missed it," which is entirely possible. Yeah. But the only way that got through the commission. The only way that the city supported that was knowing that they'd get those spots back, and now we don't have them back. And I just want to know why. It was a. Ne- it was supposed to be a net gain of like seven spots yep, or something. Seven or nine or whatever. It was. A, it was a minimal gain, but it was still a net gain. Those and spots and now the back. the first floor of that garage is open almost all the time, and it turns out that is for parking of non guests. My wife did a little investigative work. You can park there for eight bucks if you're seeing someone that's staying there. Like if you want to go to the bar. So it's not public parking. You got to pay for it. You got to pay the Marriott for it. It's crazy. Anyhow, I, I, I'm, I'm just I'm fired up about it, and uh, I love Aggieville so much. I know you folks. If you, if you really need to go to Aggieville, like it was graduation, and so I totally forgot that. I graduated in December, and I didn't walk. I don't think December graduations are real. What you didn't walk? Wow. That's you did. Yeah. <laughs> Bleep no. <laughs> no, I don't. It's a December graduation. I walked. Have it at the union. Hand out some onion rings. I don't know. What's a, it's a December graduation, man. Graduation's in the in the May. You, that's the big one. No, you always graduate. Can we in can we talk about sports you should, now? You should always no. graduate in December. What are we going to talk about? What do you want to talk about? <laughs> K State Sports? Yeah. No. The so, ceremony is shorter. The ceremony is shorter. It, graduations suck. We're in agreement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then why not walk at the shorter one? I rest my case. Mm. I didn't walk in spring. I think walking's so overrated. I do. I mean, look, let's be honest. You and I graduated with journalism degrees. Mm-hmm. Was this some. High and mighty academic accomplishment we pulled off. Nope. Yep. That's exactly it. If I'm getting my degree in engineering or pre-med or uh, what else? Vet med. Business. Brewing sciences. Distilling sciences. Brewing and distilling (laughs) sciences. Yeah, but I'd be wasted on my own product. Someone, who was it uh, on the site? Uh, I'm totally spacing off his name. K-Ned. No. Is it King Jim? I, so whoever works at Purdue, King Jim, King Jim, seven, King Jim that they have they have that. Except it's also not for just alcohol; it is for uh, biofuels, like this mm. distilling or whatever you do to create like grain, corn, whatever. Let's, here's your question. <laughs> <my best. laughs> so. <Jeez. laughs> Rabbit hole. First question of the second half comes from Dur. Yeah. 
Oh, that's what I, that was more letters than he put in his name, I believe, uh, or her name. Yeah, uh, Yuri has been awesome. He's been like my. I agree with everything he or she is saying. So, so that's what you think's awesome. Welcome you have to, to have your your yes. feelings validated. Yes. Is exactly. it, is it a Ryan Gilbert burner? I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is their first time asking a question, so welcome to the podcast. Um, when do you expect K State to name an offensive coordinator? Right after the bowl game, or a few weeks after? Ah, uh, that's a great question. When's spring signing period? February, like early February. Yeah, probably I the think first after, Wednesday of February. I don't know. I mean, I would think mid January on. Right, maybe it'll happen right after signing day. There's a lot of coaching changes after signing day. I mean, there just mm-hmm. are. Yeah, come to come to uh, whatever school. Yeah, sure, sign right here. Oh, I'm looking forward to being your coach. Yeah, it's day after signing, I'm leaving. I mean, it's just all sales. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. And honestly, I'm not sure he knows who he's going with. I don't think he has. I think he's truly. Um, slow playing this as he focuses on recruiting in the bowl. Why add this in? There's no, there's no point. There's of, no hurry. There's no point of hiring somebody right now. I mean, if you're not going to flip any recruits. He, so, and he's in a position that if he didn't find anyone he likes, he'll name Colin Klein. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got a guy. I mean, I, I think it might still be Colin, but he might want to identify someone who has been coordinator to help him out as the co. Or maybe he'll name a coordinator named Colin the Co. But I feel like he's got a good fallback plan in his book. And so he can kind of take his time. I don't know. It is fascinating to me that he has kind of put this off. This this would this would bother me as as the boss. I need to fill this. I need to fill this. This is how my brain works. So I would I would have to get that done. But he seems pretty focused on recruiting right now. I'm going to say, are we, are we all going to sneeze today? I sneeze. I blame Daphne. Oh, it's not Daphne. Oh, sweet Daphne. Mr. Allergy's over here. Um, I'm going to project, make a prediction, Thursday, January 20th in the afternoon. Okay, Thursday? Thursday, January 20th. January 20th. Uh, 2022? 2022. We will find out. That is my target. I don't know. It's, It's... Two weeks after the bowl game plus two days. It's like 16 days. Okay. I feel like that's a good enough steam to let off from the bowl game, and then you can find your guy. 16 days. 16 days. Okay. Easy Someone someone said that – I was doing a talk show the other day, and they mentioned someone redshirting in 1920, and my brain was like, God, that guy's old. And then I realized he meant 2019-20. But he said 1920, and it really bothered me. It really threw me (laughs) off. Hmm. Well, go ahead. He's honored. That was a little aside. There's just kind of stuff I throw in. Next question from A went two five. Are we going to look back on the Texas loss this year as a blessing in disguise for the program long term, similar to the Iowa State loss before Bill Snyder left for the last time? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Could well yeah. be. If they get the coordinator hire right. Ask me in three years. I mean, if the coordinator hire turns out to be great and he becomes a head coach because he's so incredible and Colin Klein becomes the coordinator after that and he's incredible and everything's incredible and we're all getting fitted for national championship rings, yeah, it worked out great. Are you going to – you're going to fit us for national championship yes. rings? Yes, I will. If, if K-State picks up those first downs and they win the game against Texas, does Courtney Messingham get fired? I don't <sighs> think so. I don't know. <sighs> But he started dropping hints, though, earlier. I mean, even after the Baylor game, I didn't like our offensive game plan. Just freaking flat out. I mean, I think it was. And I got to tell you how much I appreciate that from a coach. I think it was boiling up to a point. Like, I think once you hit the Baylor game, it was kind of like, hey, that seat's kind of hot, even though you can still win eight games. You know, and then after, I mean, once you get into the post game and you just you just see Chris Kleiman's demeanor. Oh. Oh, you just you just kind of know. You knew. <laughs> like, I, knew, I knew that he knew that he was going to have to fire a friend. Yeah, and it was pretty obvious. He, he was just he was sick about it. He was sick about it. the whole game. Yeah, the ramifications of the game, everything. My prediction to this question for the answer is yes. I think you will, and I think because I'm with you guys. I don't think he gets fired if K State wins that game, even if the, how terrible their offensive game plan. Looked. I didn't say that. I said that he could have been. 
I'm not saying that he was surefire one way or the other, but an eight win, I think there's at least a shot that, yes. that because like I had said, it was boiling. I mean, it was there was there was definitely some tension. I think. So what you're saying is, the pot was boiling, but the smoke alarms hadn't come on yet. Right. You know the the pot is getting warmer. It's almost bubbling. Yeah. But does a boiling pot set off the smoke alarms? Sure. I does. mean, if you're in an old college house, probably like <laughs> like you live in. But yeah. <laughs> I guess you do. You guys live in a nice new apartment. Hmm. I'm sorry. Nicer. Next to a shooting gallery. <laughs> So switching over to some basketball now, the third question comes from CW Powercat. Do you remember a season when the Big 12 was this deep from top to bottom? Early indications seem that this year will be a gauntlet night in and night out. You know, there always is a really competitive Big 12 basketball, and it's going to be brutal. What I don't see this year is what K-State and Iowa State were last year, what TCU's been in the past, just the easy victory. You know, earlier in the year, you played K-State, you were going to get a win, unless you were Iowa State. And then they kind of came around at the end. But I don't see that presence this year. Maybe I don't know enough about TCU this year. But K-State's not going to be an easy out. I'm not saying they're going to win a ton of games. I'm just saying this team will be more competitive. They went out and found three guys that can score. I saw the um, the stats up on, on the Twitter machine about how K-State's third in the Big 12 in points per possession. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's impressive. That's not a Bruce team right there. That, that just goes to show you, though, that he went out and altered his team in a favorable way through the portal. And this team might have a much higher upside than what we're seeing right now because the defense usually comes around last, and they played some decent defense here. I mean, Wichita State was better defense than Marquette. They won. They lost. And so I think that's really what it's going to come down to. But these guys are are capable of scoring uh, on more possessions than they have in the past. And the reason that's good is because Bruce plays, for the most part, a lethargic brand of basketball. Now, Marquise Noel kind of cranks that up a little bit because he likes to push it. But for the most part, it is a shot clock-based offense. We got this many seconds. Let's use them all. It's how they typically run it. And now they're getting better shots within that time frame than they have in the past. I think they're going to be okay. I think this conference is going to be really tough. But I also think the top of this is the top. I don't see K-State beating KU. I don't see K-State beating Texas. I don't see K-State beating some of those teams that are at the top of the conference. So is losing by less progress? I don't think so. I'll say to get back to the the top of the question as far as the depth of the Big 12, maybe – Three years ago when K-State won the conference with Texas Tech, and that was the it ended the streak of KU. And I think that's the key here to say the conference is deep when it isn't KU isn't a shoe in. Mm-hmm. You know, because when it was just KU, it was always KU, and then you have maybe one or two contenders, and then everyone else is just there. You know, they might that you know, most teams, probably eight or nine of the teams are capable of beating KU on any given night. But nine times out of ten, they're going to lose that game. You know, KU's going to win. So I think now you have so many contenders. And even Iowa State, who wasn't predicted to be anything this year, now they're being ranked and, you know, they're playing well. You know, who knows if that'll stick around when they get to Big 12 play. But at least they look really good right now when you compare to what they were predicted to be. So I think that this very well could be the deepest you've seen the big 12 just because who knows who's going to be compete. There's, there's four or five teams that could potentially win the regular season. It's going to be a fun year of basketball, but on the other hand, I don't think it's going to be fun for K state because at some point somebody has to lose the games. Mm-hmm. It's it's just like when we talk about conference realignment, OU and Texas going to sec, somebody has got to lose in the sec. And, you know, this season for Big 12 basketball, somebody's going to lose some games. And I'm, I would I would probably guess that TCU is going to be your back marker scrub that wins maybe four games. And then K-State might be next with five or six. And you I know, would put Oklahoma State there, too. Down yeah, there too. Uh, Oklahoma State's probably down there now that Cade Cunningham is not there. And, you know, they've probably dropped off a bit. But, you know, I, I think that there's definitely seven teams that are better than K-State. I see. I think that there's two main – there's two main um, – I don't want to say divisions. 
Sure, I guess you could say divisions in this in this conference. That is the upper half, and that is Kansas, that is Baylor, that is Texas. And if you want to throw Texas Tech in there, sure. They've had some nice wins. I'm still not sold on them with the new coach, but we'll throw them in there. Those are teams that they will be favored in every single game they play, unless they obviously play each other, and they should win the rest of the games. And then you have that second tier group, which is where you have your Oklahoma State, you have your K-State, you have your TC, you have your West Virginia, and you have your Iowa State. And, and the reason I'm putting Iowa State in that category is, again, they have some nice wins, but I, I, I want to see more. I mean, they beat Jackson State 47 to 37. 47 to 37 in a college basketball game. Was, that's so ugly. Against Jackson State. What was it? Jacksonville State. Was Jackson it? State, hmm. where Coach Prime is coaching football. That Jackson State. They beat them 47 37. So I would put you have your top three or four teams, and then you have everybody else. And what that means is those teams can, those, those games are going to be flip, flip a coin, right? Those teams can you can beat them on any given night, which also means you can lose on any given night. So it's one of those things where K State is in this weird predicament of you could very easily, if you're an optimistic person, see them having success because the conference is is so much more top heavy than it is more tiers throughout the conference. But if you look at it the other way, they could be the ones that lose all those games. So I'm holding out judgment on how good this conference is until I start to see some separation in the middle. Yeah. Last season and the year before, K-State and Iowa State were garbage. But, Zach, you mentioned it. When K-State won the Big 12, that league was as deep as it had ever been. And, you know, for me, like growing up throughout high school, you know, once TCU really started to turn that corner, when Jamie Dixon arrived, the Big 12, top to bottom, is equally or if not better as it is now. And, you know, K-State during that, that Big 12 season – was down, what, 22, 20-something to West Virginia? And then, you know, obviously came back and won that game. And so that, that kind of shows you the best team was K-State and the worst team was West Virginia, I believe, that year. So this year is – I mean, let's, let's throw out those last couple of years with K-State and Iowa State. This is very typical for the Big 12, mm-hmm. very typical. Next question comes from CW Powercat once again. Looking at the other teams in the conference, where do you now think K-State will finish at the end of the regular season? I don't I haven't altered my opinion on where they fit into the Big 12 based on their improvement. I mean, again, they had so much space between them and the upper eight in the conference that they closed up a little bit towards the end of the year. But, I mean, even though they were more competitive, they did that through incredible defense and just outworking teams that thought they were going to get an easy win. I think they're much improved. I think they're much more uh, palatable product to put on the court. It's more enjoyable to cover a K-State game or watch it in the case of fans. They're they're really good kids. I mean, that I always say that about – that's important to me. If, if When you see me getting critical of teams, it's often not just what they're doing on the court but off the court. And I get villainized for it, but I – I mean, I think having crappy kids in your locker room leads to generally bad performances. Not always. I mean, if they're really good, they can overcome their bad attitudes. I, I think they're still at the, somewhere in the 7, 8, 9, 10 range. I don't think they'll be 10. If they're 10, this conference is brutal because they are better. But I, I don't think they've – I haven't seen anything from them so far. They're 6-3. and three. We're not talking about a team that – is nine and zero at this point? We're talking about a six and three team that is obviously better, but are they improved enough to close the gap on everyone else? You you could make a strong argument that the upper part of the conference improved as much as K State improved, which is scary considering Baylor was a national champion. So I, I'm I'm comfortable where I've got them s- slotted, but I know this is going to be more fun to cover them. It will be a lot more fun. That basketball last year, and granted, I didn't cover them in person because of the pandemic, was mostly hideous. It was was unpalatable. It was awful. It was awful. Until the last month of the season. Then then it started looking more like a team. And and I'm not – I don't say that to be critical. And I know we don't want to use the pandemic as a crutch, but here's the two sides of that. The pandemic greatly impacted a brand-new baby young basketball team. It just did. He didn't have enough practice time. The other side of that is, why were they so young? 
Well, because the coach can't retain players and a lot of guys left or had to be run off. So there's two sides of it. But the reality was it did impact the product in a negative way. And so probably has the coach in his recruiting. Now that he has altered his approach, and this is something I'm going to ask him in the future, you had always been hesitant to go too far into the transfer area of recruiting. You've done it now. Do these three kids encourage you to keep doing it? Because I don't see how they wouldn't. I mean, from everything we're hearing, they have slid right into the locker room, become good teammates, meshed with the existing guys and the staff. And guys, I mean, I was I ran the numbers for my daily delivery. I don't have them here. That's not them. <laughs> um, but I, the numbers these guys are putting up over the last two, three games, incredible, particularly Noel. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, the guy almost had a triple-double. I don't remember a K-Stater ever having a triple-double. There's been one in program history. What? One triple-double in was program it? history. Was it uh, – do you remember who they said, Ryan? Yeah. Um, what was his name? Pearson McAtee, I think, had it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it's probably – It was the guy from – That's probably referring to his GPA. <laughs> 60s. The 60s. In the 60s, yeah. uh, Willie Morrell. Actually, that might be right. Yeah, that is probably the best player in the yeah. 60s. Either way. I can't believe no one at K-State's ever had a triple It's really tough. That's that's a lot of basketball. That's a lot of assists. And yeah. it's a lot of good basketball that K-State's played, and they haven't had a single player. Or they've had one single player one single time. Now, they might fact-check me in, in, the, in the comments and tell me I'm completely wrong, but I could have swore that's what Tom said after that. Oh, no, Pearson. He's got it. Either way. Okay. I, I'm just telling you right now, if I've got double points – and double-digit rebounds in a game, I ain't going to get the assist. I ain't passing the ball to you, <laughs> you suckers. I'm going to just keep shooting it. Russell Westbrook will do that. I know. I'm the star here. Russell Westbrook gets a— Russell Westbrook also had triple doubles, though. Yeah. yeah so he yeah. would once he gets 10 points, 10 assists, they also have eight, the ball. They also have eight no, he's, I mean, he, he was scoring 30 points a night. I know. He <laughs> likes to pat his stats. Though. To answer this question, I don't think I, my opinion has changed much. On K-State, I, I think my opinion on the league has changed a little bit because I've watched Oklahoma. I've watched Texas Tech. I've, I've tried to watch every single team at least for um, for more than a half, and I've, I've come pretty close to doing that. And the talent that K-State has is so comparable, if not better, than other teams in the in the conference. And that's not something that we've been able to say the last two years. They have guys that can put the basketball into the hoop. They have guys that can defend at a high level. They can, they can do these things. It's just a matter of will they do these things. And for the, the person who looks at it through the lens of, you know, oh, well, the team's not any good, you're, you're, you're looking through the lens of saying that they won't do it because they can do it. It's a matter of will they do it. And if you haven't seen it, there's nothing to tell you that they will do it. We've seen it at times so far in the first nine games, but nine games of a college basketball season is what? The equivalent of two games in a college football season? I mean, were we sitting here after the Stanford and the and the Southern Illinois game? Injuries aside, ready to say, you know, oh, well, this team, you know, that we're expecting them to be seven and five. They're going to go four and four and eight. Like, you know, right. it's hard it's to. It's too small of a snapshot. It, it's a small, it's small of a snapshot, and it's and you're not in conference play yet. Like we didn't think Baylor was going to be that good in football. They barely beat Texas State in the first game of the regular season, and now they ended up Big Twelve champions. So it's hard to sit here before conference play and t- and say, oh, I am for sure ready to change my opinion on K State. That's the same reason why I'm not ready to change my opinion on Iowa State yet. So to answer the question. I still think that they will be in that second tier. It's just going to be a matter of are they in the high second tier or are they in the low second tier? Here's the thing. TCU has a loss to Santa Clara. Oklahoma State's got a loss to Oakland and also Wichita State that K-State beat. Texas doesn't even have a win over a mid-major team yet. And Iowa State, I'm still not bought in. So to answer this question, I wouldn't be shocked if K-State can get up to sixth place in this league. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and we, I mean, yeah, I don't want to. Woo! That's it. That's it. Get up wow. to sixth place. Woo! Well, that's the thing, right? Fans aren't fans aren't accepting of sixth place. I mean, that's that's the problem that you run into. You and can so, still get a you'll, if you're a sixth place in the Big Twelve. Still this a buy. Like just talked about. It's still a technically buy. a buy. A buy at the Big Twelve tournament. tournament. Yeah, oh. <laughs> with the nine teams. That's you're Wait. getting into the big dance though. Yeah, there's only nine teams. Place. Ten well, teams. No nine teams. No Oklahoma State this year. Oh, they can't do the postseason tournament. Mm-mm. Are they band band? Yep. Huh. 
Mm. Mm. So Oklahoma State basically just doesn't count. Mm. Mm. So you can finish seventh and get a bye. What do you know? Mm. Last question of the podcast comes from Contra Cat. What will it take to get the Octagon of Doom in effect this season? There are six conference games before KU. What's their conference record going into that game? I don't I'm not looking at the conference schedule. I, I don't know. I mean, the students will be fired up. The problem isn't the students. The, the noise level in that arena is okay. I mean, the students are working their butts off. The students love this team. I mean, the students, if you look at it from their perspective, except for the older students, this is a vast improvement of what you've seen the last two years. The problem is going to be the alumni aren't showing up. Now, I got an interesting um, message. I think it was a text from an older fan. Uh, a guy who is retired, um, has always donated, and has decent seats at Bramlage. But they said after the pandemic, there's been some openings in the seating charts. You know, So they sent out the mailing or the email, would you like to move your seats? He's like, yeah, I'd like to be in one of those main sections. Let's take a look at it. No openings. And this gets to my point. This is where Gene Taylor is probably feeling some conflict. He's got the revenue from the ticket sales on the alumni side, but people aren't showing up because they don't want to give up their seats. If there's a home run hire, the next guy, they want to be there. They want to be part of it. And they support K-State basketball. They just don't want to watch this version of it. Or they don't want to make, just like me with Aggieville with the with the burger. <laughs> They don't want to. They don't want to walk two blocks to see this product, or they, you know, whatever. They don't want to do whatever they have to do: drive from Kansas City, drive from Salina, drive from Wichita, drive from Garden City, wherever they're coming from. They're not willing to do it. Is it the product, yeah. or is it the coach? Well, the coach is the product in many ways. But this product of basketball is fun to watch. It's better these transfers. No, well, no, I agree with you. I'm not it's disagreeing with you, but people are fed up with the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And that is the product. The product is, hey, we're good. We were really good this year. We got you a, a shared Big 12 title. I hope you enjoy it because we're going to suck for three years. That's not how it works. It's, I, I don't, that is not, there's nothing normal about that. And I, I agree with some people who say, well, everyone drops off after, you know, typically, unless you're, you know, a reloader like Kansas that just gets whoever they want. They blew up their, their locker room and ended up with maybe the best team they've had in 10, 15 years. They're just, people are just tired of it. They just, they, they know this, this story. Maybe he'll get a group that's good again and it'll be one fun season, but it's never really overwhelmingly fun basketball. Zach, would you agree with that? No. Even during the Barry, and there were some fun games. Beating Kentucky like, was fun, but that wasn't beautiful basketball. Like you said, this team plays, and Bruce Weber, they play a lethargic style of basketball. It's not necessarily – they may win games. It's not necessarily going to be exciting like you see. That's the trend of college basketball, though, guys. Like, I would if, disagree, Zach, on this, this K-State no, team. No, I'm, I'm not – we're talking about – Past this this year, it's, it's I just, different. I don't know if Marquise that's what the Noel is really asking. Them. Marquise Noel brings kind of more of an up tempo I than think, what K State has had. I think the product of college basketball is going down as a whole because you have these top end players that can go to the NBA G League now, and that's not but they something they still aren't. They really there, aren't. There, there's some. There's a couple. See, it's, I don't. A couple go overseas. A couple go to the G League, and even then, what like Lamelo Ball's really the only big star of the last couple I don't, of years. But I don't accept that premise that because some elite players go to the league, the whole game suffers. Um, I've covered Kansas Conference basketball and football back in my days at the Salon Journal. I saw some great basketball covering the KCAC because it's a light comparison. Mm -hmm. I mean, those teams might stink if you put them on the court against even a bad Big 12 team. Of course they would, but in comparison... Some of those offenses and scoring, it was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. So it you're kind of measuring against a like product. So I don't accept that. I think I do think college basketball's changed because I think officials are ruining it. Simple truth. I mean, I think some of the rule changes have ruined it. Uh, you can no longer play defense, which is odd. You can no longer play defense, but scoring is way down. 
I don't know. I mean, I I just don't think college basketball is as fun as it used to be. I agree with you guys. This team is kind of fun. They still have those periods where they kind of drive you crazy and Bruce drives you crazy. <laughs> and it's been amazing to watch the newcomers, hearing their coach squawking at them constantly through the game, how they're tuning him out. They're, they're, that's key number one to playing for Bruce. You got to pick up what you need to pick up and tune out the rest because the guy doesn't shut up. It's it's unbelievable. I've never heard a coach yell so much that he micromanage his team. No wonder they shut down. And I think they went out and got a bunch of guys who are, are immune to it because they haven't been around it. And they're just like, oh, I'm just going to go play. So I don't know. I, I think uh, we're not going to see the octagon anytime soon. And let's be really blunt here. The octagon hasn't been a thing for a while. Yeah. Nobody is doomed by going there. Mm-hmm. It's been a pretty easy place to win. The answer to the to look back at, I have the conference schedule pulled up right here. They open the season on the first at Oklahoma. Loss. Yes, I would agree. Then they have Texas at home, which I think we all can agree is a loss. No, then they go- I very strongly disagree, Cole. Okay. I just mentioned how Texas hasn't beaten even a mid-major team this season. Okay. And well, they're going into the octagon of doom. <laughs> <laughs> then they go on the road to West Virginia. I think a team that's very like mm-hmm. um, like K-State. They have a better record. They haven't also has played as tough a schedule. Um, I think that's a game that if K-State wants to have a successful season, that's a game they need to win. Now, will they? I don't know. I'm just saying that that is a game that if they want to have a successful season, I mean, if we're they calling need to success, win that game. But if we're calling successful 7-11 and make the tournament, then that, yeah, I don't think you really need to win it necessarily. But when you look at the Big 12, the argument can be made. And then they play TCU at home a game again. I think they'll win that one. That's a game that they should win. Texas Tech at home, again, another one of those top fringe, tw- top 25 teams. Again, you have to win these home games, right? I mean, with how good the league is, anytime you have a chance to play a team that's not Baylor, Kansas, or Texas. Get Texas out of this conversation. They're not that good. Okay, Just me, because it's Texas, everybody's going to assume well, they're good. They're always overrated in every single sport they play. No, Chris Beard might be a different story, but I'm looking at their schedule right now. So um, you've got their wins are Houston Baptist, which wow. is, is the premier Baptist college team in the Houston metro area. <laughs> they lost to Gonzaga by 12 points. They beat Northern Colorado. Yeah. Uh, then they beat San Jose State. Then they beat California Baptist. That's the premier Baptist school in all of California. Mm-hmm. So they're pretty much, they're getting ready for their Baylor game. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're locked in on beating the Baptists this year. Sam Houston, um, who was great in a certain war a with Bob Mexico, a, a but Bob as he, Alamo, right, right. Him and Bob Alamo were big stars <laughs> back in the day. Um, and then they beat uh, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, whatever. That's where Matt Figures now coach. Then they lost to what? yeah, Fig moved there. Yep, huh. um, which is interesting. That's the old Texas Pan American that merged with another school. Mm-hmm. Where Lon Kruger yeah. came from. Seton Hall was ranked and they lost 64 60. And um, let's see, Tuesday night, they play Arkansas Pine Bluff, which is a, you know, a familiar, that's, that's a typical appearance on a K State schedule. Then they'll play Stanford, then they'll play Rice, then they'll play Incarnate Word, and then they open the Big 12 schedule. No, we'll see about Texas. We will, but I'm I'm a big Chris Beard fan, so I, I think they'll too. be okay. I I just are we still talking about Well hang on, I want to say something real yeah. quick. Cool. You're a coach. You want to be a coach one day, right? I am. What's coach. your number one goal yes. each and every time you take the field? My number one goal? Cover the spread. Only goal. Just win. <laughs> just win. So Zach, no, like you mentioned earlier, he wants to look good. Bruce Weber is a defensive coach. It's not the prettiest brand of basketball. I agree. But if yep. you win, why does it matter if it's sexy or not? All you want to do is win. It doesn't matter if you win 81 to 77 or 51 to 48. Why does it matter to people? Well, because pitching in baseball and defense in football and and basketball are a little bit more subtle. You know what I mean? you got to kind of appreciate the nuance of it. God, this team's boring. They're hitting like 250. Well, they're winning all their games like two to one. Well, that's great. You know, that's good. It's the same thing. I mean, 
reducing a basketball game to the level of ugly so that you can win. The, the, the flip side of it is if they were running and gunning and scoring a bunch of points and giving up a bunch of points, I'd lose my mind with that too. Basically what I'm trying to say here, Gills, is I won't be happy. I just won't be. I'm not a happy person. I'm miserable. I, I, I'd prefer to have the defensive team. I mean, I think that's how K-State has always ha- found their success, by outworking other people. I think that's in the DNA of being a K-Stater, and that gets you to being a defensive team. But it has been really ugly basketball at times, really ugly. Even when they're winning, it's still, oh. I mean, I think Dean Wade is one of the best players to come out of K-State in a long time. And you can blame injuries. But I blame coaching. I don't think he ever realized his nearest potential that we're seeing now at the NBA. For whatever reason, they didn't hit the right nerve, didn't hit the right note with him. Now he's got someone that's getting it out of him. So we'll see. I, I Like I said, I'm optimistic about this team, and I enjoy watching this team, and I sure as hell enjoy covering this team because they're really good dudes. I, I don't know if there's one guy that I kind of wince. They've they've had that in the past with, with in terms of character, and you know I think the way Bruce Weber coaches, he better have a clean locker room. He just has to always manage that locker room, and that doesn't mean getting Boy Scouts. And Mark Smith has a history of not being a good teammate, but everything indicates now he's a great teammate. Ish Masood's going to be here for a number of years if he sticks around and doesn't transfer again, and that he's going to be a crowd favorite. We watch him and we forget he was just – he's Nigel Pack. I mean, he's the same age. So, I mean, you put him into that class, it gets pretty special, but you're going to have to constantly refresh everything. Well, if you if you do get that one bad egg, you've got you've to make sure that half of the locker room doesn't attach to your Marcus Foster and depart with them. But that's the problem. Yeah. I Bruce agree. doesn't manage mm-hmm. a locker room mm-hmm. well, and that happens almost every time. Mm-hmm. You get a bad guy in there that is chirping and bitching, and it spreads like a virus. And I, there's a guy hanging around town now who was that guy, and I'd prefer if he was nowhere near this basketball program while understanding that Manhattan might be where he feels the safest and where he he's not going to get lost in this situation in, in life. I, I just – he – this happens – his locker room doesn't blow up by chance. His locker room blows up because it's unmanaged. It's run by the players. And if you got the great alpha in that locker room, like a Barry Brown, you're fine. Barry Brown will run you out of the program. The most special thing Barry Brown did wasn't on the court. It was in the locker room. You mentioned the West Virginia game. That was Barry Brown going to the locker room and screw the coaches. We're going to win this game. What are you guys doing? It was all Barry. So if you got someone that manages the locker room, the team's going to be okay. And I think Mark Smith might be that guy. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar enough with this team right now and, and the new chemistry. But he's got a good locker room from everything I can tell. And that bodes well for the season. That's it. But, boy, we talked a lot. That was long. That's it for this edition of the Power Cat Questions podcast. I think you now understand why we did two last week. But signing day is Wednesday, so the whole topic list of – of things to talk about it, Go Power Cat's going to get changed a little bit here as the week goes on. It's finals week in Manhattan. No basketball this week. They did play again on Sunday at Nebraska, the fourth straight Sunday game. It's crazy. I wrote a story about how unfortunate and just kind of a convergence of circumstances this was. But soon they'll be playing Big 12 basketball. And we know that because Gills will be there. No matter what he wants to do with his life, he has to be here. That and bartending. Those are his two things. Thank you for listening to the Power Cat Podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Power Cat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class-leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.